In this lesson, we will continue our study of the Lewis structures to explore the role of resonance in the stability of covalent compounds. The learning objectives that you should be focusing on while watching this video are how to evaluate the stability of a Lewis structure based on the formal charge on each atom, and to explain resonance based on Lewis structures. To begin with, Let's revisit the Lewis structure of the polyatomic ion nitrite, which we drew in the last video. Nitrite is composed of a single nitrogen atom and two oxygen atoms and has a net charge of negative one. And when we distributed the electrons according to the octet rule on this molecule, we saw that we have a structure where nitrogen has one single bond to oxygen and a double bond to the other oxygen. However, one could also draw the structure like so, where we have the double bond to oxygen on the left and the single bond to oxygen on the right. Which is the correct drawing? The answer is both are correct and neither are really correct. In reality, what occurs is an average of the two structures. And that's what we call the resonance structure. So whenever we encounter a molecule that has Lewis structures that are essentially equivalent, but simply are drawn in a different orientation, that is when we see resonance exhibited by our molecule. The way we depict resonance structures is using this double-headed arrow to indicate that they are equivalent. Another way of depicting a resonance structure is as an average of the two structures. What we can see at the bottom is that neither oxygen has a double bond or a single bond. In fact, what they have are one and a half bonds. And so that's represented by having a solid line as a single bond and this dashed line showing the half bond. And what occurs there is that the electrons are being evenly spread between the two oxygen atoms. This is important because it leads to greater stability for the nitrite ion. When we are drawing Lewis structures, sometimes in satisfying the octet rule, we may give a particular atom more electrons around it than it actually brought to the table when we were counting the contribution of valence electrons from each of our atoms. When we have more electrons around an atom than it had as valence electrons to begin with, this creates an imbalance between the nuclear charge of that atom and the electron cloud surrounding it. We can measure this imbalance in electrons and nuclear charge by using the equation for formal charge. Formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons that that atom would have according to the periodic table minus any non-bonding or lone pair electrons minus half of the bonding electrons that it has around it. So let's look at an example of sulfur dioxide. So here we have one representation of sulfur dioxide like the nitrite molecule, you can see that this would probably exhibit resonance by having the double bond on the left and the single bond on the right, as opposed to the single way it's shown here. But let's just put that aside for a minute, because right now I'd like you to focus on formal charge. So we're gonna look at this structure and each of the atoms within it, and begin assigning formal charge. So we'll start with the oxygen on the right. Oxygen has six valence electrons. In the diagram, we can see from our dot structure that there are one, two, three, four non-bonding electrons on this oxygen atom. So we're gonna subtract those from the six valence electrons that our oxygen atom started with. Remember that when atoms form covalent bonds, they do so by sharing an electron with a neighboring atom. So they only get to have those electrons near them about half of the time if they're good sharing friends. So when we're counting the electrons in bonds, even though 
a single bond does contain two electrons when we're checking our octet rule, the oxygen atom is only going to get those two electrons half of the time. So each bond only counts as half of an electron. So we have two bonds and two bonds because of the double bond. So we have four bonding electrons. Getting those half of the time, we multiply by half, and that brings us to only two electrons. So six minus four minus four times a half gives us zero charge. So there's no formal charge on that oxygen atom. Next, let's look at the sulfur atom. Sulfur, like oxygen, is a group six element and has six valence electrons. In this structure, we have only two non-bonding electrons on our sulfur, so we would subtract those out. And from the three bonds that we see coming off of sulfur, there are six electrons involved in those bonds. Sulfur only gets those electrons half of the time, so we are only going to subtract three electrons for those bonds. So we have six valence electrons minus two non-bonding electrons minus six times a half, which would be three, and we end up with a value of positive one. So that indicates that our sulfur atom would have a charge associated with it of plus one, and we'll indicate that by simply putting our positive next to the sulfur. Finally, let's look at the other oxygen atom. Again, we see six valence electrons being contributed to the structure. We have on this oxygen three lone pairs, so six non-bonding electrons. So that actually would bring us to a balanced charge. However, we also have two electrons in the bond between this oxygen and sulfur. Oxygen gets of those two electrons only half of the time. So we have essentially one extra electron on our oxygen. So it results in a negative one charge which can be displayed by putting a negative next to that oxygen. You'll notice that if we sum up all of the formal charges on this molecule, we have negative one and positive one. Those cancel each other out, so we're left with a net charge of zero, which is good because we know that sulfur dioxide is an uncharged molecule. If we were dealing with a polyatomic ion, we would want the formal charges on each of the atoms to add up to the same charge as we know that polyatomic ion to have. Now let's look a little bit more closely at the concept of resonance. So resonance isn't just something that we show on paper because we need to display that there are equivalent structures. It actually has a physical purpose. If we were to study a molecule using X-ray diffraction or sophisticated spectroscopy techniques, we would actually see that molecules do not exist as a fluctuation between the different resonance structures. They do exist as a resonance hybrid, so as that average structure that I was showing earlier. And this resonance hybrid comes about through the delocalization of pi bonding electrons. And this creates stability within the molecule because it allows the formal charge to be more spread out. So if we again look at this sulfur dioxide molecule, by exhibiting resonance, our sulfur still has the same number of electrons around it. It has the two non-bonding electrons. There are two electrons in the bond going down to the left, two electrons in the bond going down to the right. And then if we consider that these dashed lines each represent a half bond, there would be two electrons between the two half bonds. So essentially we still have three sets of bonding electrons, so we get to have three electrons from that, and we end up with that same plus one charge. However, if we look at the oxygens, we can now see that they are balanced. They both have the same bonding pattern. When we look at the number of valence and non-bonding electrons and bonding electrons, what we find is that each of the oxygens actually carries a negative one-half charge. So we have the positive charge on our sulfur, but the negative charge is now distributed evenly throughout the molecule, creating greater stability. Here, looking at the polyatomic ion nitrite, we can, sorry, nitrate, 
we can see how this resonance is achieved through the merging of pi bonds. So on the left, I have one representative Lewis structure of the nitrite molecule. Nitrite has three bonds to oxygen. And to draw a Lewis structure that would fulfill the octet rule, we actually end up with a formal charge of plus one on the nitrogen and two of the oxygens with negative formal charges. So if we sum these all together, we have negative, positive, negative, we end up with a net charge of negative one, which is what we understand nitrate to have. If we were to look at the bonding orbitals in the p orbitals assigned to that lowest structure on the left, we would have one of the p orbitals on nitrogen bonding to one of the oxygens. And so in that case, that bond would be rigid and non-rotatable, whereas the other two oxygen bonds would be rotatable and free. Instead, through delocalization of these double bond electrons to each of the oxygen atoms, we end up with a pi bond that's blended across all of the oxygens equally. So this is where we're seeing delocalization of the pi electrons, and it gives the whole molecule a rigid structure. At this point, I'd like you to work with me through a problem in which we're going to draw Lewis structures for a molecule of formamide. After we've drawn the Lewis structure, we're going to see if there's a second possible way we could draw it and assign a resonance structure. After drawing the resonance structures, of which there should be two, we'll assign formal charge to the atoms and use that to determine which of our two structures is most likely to be stable. So, so here is one possible structure, one possible accurate Lewis dot structure for formamide, and here is one other. And they are both accurate Lewis representations, so they would exhibit resonance. Next, I'd like you to look at assigning the formal charges to these structures. On the one on the left, all of the elements are actually perfectly balanced in terms of the number of valence electrons they contributed and the number of electrons that are surrounding them in the Lewis structure. On the right-hand depiction, we see that our oxygen atom is carrying one extra electron compared to what it originally has, and our nitrogen atom is actually carrying one less. This means that we have a separation of charge on our formamide molecule. Therefore, the resulting structure of formamide is going to more closely resemble the depiction on the left with the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Now one last practice for you. Here are three different depictions of the ion cyanate. Go ahead and assign the formal charge to the three atoms in each of these three Lewis structures, and then determine which of these structures is going to be most stable and therefore contribute the most to the structure of the ion. Pause now and resume once you've assigned the charges. As we can see, the structure number three on the far right puts the negative charge on the oxygen atom and leaves no net charge on either the carbon or the nitrogens. Therefore, the third resonance structure is going to be the most favored and contribute the most to the structure of cyanate. All right, do some practice problems to get more familiar with this topic, and then we'll move on to molecule geometry.